So hi everyone, um, good morning and welcome. For today's um, Zoom lecture series, we have Dr. Jason Plemel. Dr. Plemel is a faculty at the University of Alberta. His laboratory is investigating how microglia uh, play an important role in regeneration of injured white matter, but also how microglia can induce injury to white matter during different disease conditions. So thank you, Jason. Uh, and we look forward to hear you. Great. Uh, thanks for inviting me to speak. I'm going to speak today about remyelination, which is something that uh, my research lab studies and something I've studied for a lot of years. Uh, I'm going to try and pitch it at a level that is approachable for the summer students. There might be, for those who've heard me talk before, duplicate slides. Um, but hopefully by the end of the talk, we can all have a better appreciation of remyelination and the challenges in multiple sclerosis. So to begin at a very basic level, I think it's important that we understand what myelin is, uh, what it looks like. Uh, this is an example of a myelinated axon. So in the blue, you have the axon, and then you have this lipid membrane um, process that enwraps the axon, we call this myelin. So if you look at it in cross section, you see these multiple wrappings. And if you look at along the length of the axon, it kind of looks like this. Uh, and then there would be an adjacent myelin sheath right here. This structure would be called a node. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about how uh, this occurs, um, but we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about the biology of remyelination. And so remyelination is a process where once you have this axon that has lost its myelin, how this myelin is regenerated. Uh, and with remyelination, we talk about it in terms of regeneration and not repair because uh, this, this myelin is not fixed, it's replaced. Yeah, so it's, a, it's actually one of the better examples of central nervous system regeneration. So to begin, I just wanna talk a little bit about uh, the importance of remyelination to MS. Uh, I'm gonna talk about some key ideas about oligodendrocyte biology. Oligodendrocytes, of course, are the cells that produce myelin in the central nervous system. Um, and then some time on why remyelination fails in multiple sclerosis. Then uh, I'll talk about where we are with regards to the therapies, because there's some, uh, there is some exciting therapies. And then uh, a little bit about my interest in microglia and macrophage with regards to remyelination. So uh, to begin, this is a wonderful study by uh, Bodini and colleagues looking at uh, remyelination using PET scanning. And so what they've done is they've done sort of one time point of, uh, of, of scanning uh, with one of their PET tracers that they think is labeling myelin. Uh, and they see these areas of demyelination and then they imaged, I think it was six months later. Uh, and you can see in some of those lesions, there is more uh, staining. And so they would call that uh, remyelination or the replacement of myelin th through this PET staining. And when they compare this amount of remyelination to EDSS, which is a disability score, what you can see is that there's this negative correlation, meaning that those who have more remyelination have a, on average a lower EDSS score, suggesting that myelin uh, remyelination is protective in multiple sclerosis. And there is other studies showing this too. Um, so this provides a, a really nice proof of principle that remyelination is important in the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis. Uh, so why might that be? And so this is a really exciting area that um, I helped with when I was in Calgary, uh, some of the work of the Stice Lab. Uh, what, what has been shown by the Stice Lab and others is that there is this metabolic coupling between the oligodendrocyte and the axon. And so, uh, I, you know, not to get into the entire nitty gritty, but what was generally observed is that axonal activity causes uh, calcium entry into the myelin. And so you actually have, uh, much, much like you would at a dendrite, you have calcium entry into the myelin sheath itself. And this seems to be important in positioning um, glucose transporters such that the glucose can be um, more easily assessed into the oligodendrocyte. And then from other work, it's been shown that the glucose uh, via lactate can be released into uh, the axon. So overall, what you have is this metabolic coupling such that activity drives the release of glutamate, myelinic calcium triggers uh, the, um, the bringing in of more glucose and release into the neuron. 
And so this and other mechanisms are thought to be really important for myelin to support the health of the axon. Uh, there is other mechanisms that are likely um, going on as well, but this is, I think, one of the better described mechanisms. And so for this reason, uh, there's a large body of literature suggesting that myelin is important in the axonal health. Um, so where is this important? So this is unpublished work by Greg Duncan, still unpublished for those who are keeping track. A uh, really elegant study uh, taking a look at the relevance of remyelination to axonal health. And so what they've done in this particular uh, experiment is it's a Cooperzone model. So Cooperzone is a dietary supplement that you give to your animals and it causes demyelination. Uh, and in this uh, particular model, and I don't need to get into the details, but there's an inducible knockout system that's specific to oligodendrocytes. It prevents a key transcription factor in the biology of oligodendrocytes and prevents remyelination. So this is, uh, this is the wild type control after remyelination. And then this here is an example of the inducible knockout. So there's almost no myelin produced in these inducible knockout mice. Uh, and so when you prevent this remyelination from happening and you take a look at axonal health, uh, there's fewer axons. So um, this loss of axons in the absence of remyelination suggests that remyelination is important to protect axons um, following demyelination. And so this coupled with the, um, the, the supportive aspects of myelin, um, coupled with the multiple sclerosis disability correlates with remyelination, taken together suggest that myelin and remyelination is likely a, a very beneficial therapeutic strategy for people with MS. So remyelination and MS, what do we know? Uh, this, I always like to start with this because this gives you an idea of an MS brain. And I think, you know, even a naive observer could see that there's these little spots. Um, these little spots are areas of demyelination. Uh, the white matter has its white sheen because of the lipid structures present. Uh, and so when this is lost, you see these very overt areas of demyelination. So this is a very classic uh, sample of multiple sclerosis brain. You can see there's multiple spots, so multiple areas of demyelination, which gives the name multiple sclerosis. Um, and so if you were to take an inspection of this myelin at a higher magnification, uh, you would see this. So this is uh, how a neuropathologist might view a demyelinated area or a demyelinated plaque. Uh, if you stain with a substance like Luxol Fast Blue, which stains the lipids in blue, you can see this nice blue structure on the outside, uh, and, and the neuropathologist would call this a normal associated white matter. And then you would have this area of demyelination where it's just lacking the blue. Uh, and so this is a classic hallmark of um, demyelination, this lack of Luxol Fast Blue staining. So what do we know overall about remyelination and MS? So uh, this is an example below here of a demyelinated plaque. And I think you can appreciate that there's a loss of this blue stain. Uh, and so neuropathologists would also see these structures, which they call shadow plaques, where you have some blue staining, but it's not quite returned to normal. Uh, and so these are thought to be areas of remyelination. Uh, the idea here is that um, myelin during remyelination has slightly thinner myelin sheaths. And so overall, you have less, uh, less staining. Uh, and this gives you the presence of what's called a shadow plaque. And so you can track these shadow plaques in people, uh, uh, pathological specimens over time. And there was this one very wonderful study by Fisher who did so uh, in thousands and thousands of samples and I think hundreds of people to track the overall relationship between these different stages of plaques uh, over the disease duration of people with MS. And I think what you can see, we're just looking at purple now. There's a lot of interesting relationships, but we're looking at the purple shadow plaques. What you can see is in the early disease duration, there is actually some amount of remyelination, but on average, it only reaches about 20%. Uh, and what's also interesting is that this kind of levels off suggesting that um, there is, and we'll come back to this, this um, age slash disease duration impairment in remyelination. Uh, another thing uh, that is really quite important to realize is that this remyelination is highly variable. 
So I mentioned before, on average, there was 20% of these plaques that were remyelinated. Uh, there was this one other wonderful study uh, by, I think it was uh, Richard Reynolds' group, uh, looking at two samples they found. And in these two samples, they had on average 60 or 50% remyelination of the lesions, suggesting that there is a cohort of people uh, that have really dramatically high levels of remyelination. Uh, and we don't know really nearly enough about these people. I think these uh, could serve as a natural experiment, and I hope that people start to do this, to really try and understand uh, what makes our, one, what makes a person a high remyelinator, but also what are the correlates of people who are high remyelinators? Is there some attributes about them that we can learn about and, and then model? Um, so, uh, as a whole, you know, we're, we, we understand that remyelination is important in MS. We think that this, if we could really boost remyelination, it would be a beneficial. Uh, we also know that there's a high amount of variability person to person with remyelination. Uh, and I think another thing that is hopeful is that if there are people that have high levels of remyelination, then if we could understand what makes these uh, people having high levels of remyelination, maybe we could then design targets and, and boost the overall amount of remyelination with everyone. So uh, that leads into the idea of, well, why is remyelination sometimes not good? Uh, and I think to really get into that question, it's important to understand a little bit about oligodendrocytes, which are the cells, as I mentioned, that are important for myelin production and remyelination. So uh, a very general background about oligodendrocytes. Um, in the central nervous system, there is a population of progenitor cells, OPCs. Um, even in the adult central nervous system, there's OPCs throughout the brain, uh, and they can be labeled with specific markers and you can track them. They're very uh, beautiful and elegant cells. Um, and then as they undergo what's called differentiation, and we call it differentiation because they are, uh, it's a one-way street, so to speak. They are not able to come backwards to our knowledge, to an OPC, so they differentiate into an oligodendrocyte, uh, and then they mature and make contact with axons and myelinate them. And in the, in the instance of remyelination, they make contact with axons and remyelinate them. So what do we need to know about oligodendrocytes? Uh, this is a really, you know, quite an old study by Ben Barris's, well, it wasn't Ben Barris's group, it was Ben Barris back when he uh, did a lot of this work. Uh, and it was very elegant studies for the time. They just, you know, simple studies. They took oligodendrocyte cells and culture, uh, and they found, you know, that if you treat with certain factors, the oligodendrocytes live a lot more. So if you were to just play an oligodendrocyte progenitor cell with nothing, uh, very few of them survive. But if you give them, importantly, insulin or IGF-1, uh, there's much, much better survival of these oligodendrocytes in culture. Uh, they, he also, he did a lot of work in this area and found many factors that are important in the survival of oligodendrocytes. CNTF is still something we all use in our cultures to promote the survival of oligodendrocytes. And so it's, you know, the biology is simple. These cells are constantly requiring some trophic support, uh, pres presumably related to insulin, IGF-1, and without these, the cells die, which is probably not so different than many other cells. Another thing, and I think this is more, um, more interesting, it's been shown by many groups, but I also found this in my own work, uh, is that oligodendrocytes spontaneously differentiate. And what I mean is, uh, normally in culture, what we do is we give oligodendrocyte progenitors, we plate them down, uh, and we give them growth factors or proliferative factors to keep them going. And so, uh, for example, PDGF is uh, mitogen for oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, as is MT3. So there's these factors that you give progenitor cells to, to keep them proliferating. Once you take away those proliferative factors, uh, so long as that you have a few survival factors to keep them alive, oligodendrocytes do differentiate, and, and most of them do. And so uh, the program of differentiation doesn't need to be stimulated per se. It just needs to be disinhibited. And I think this is really important when we think about remyelination uh, in the sense that, um, you know, we sometimes we talk about these things in terms of the positives and the negatives, the factors that are promoting and the factors that are inhibiting. But with regards to oligodendrocytes, at least in culture, uh, they can do the differentiation program completely independently of factors that are 
promoting differentiation. That isn't to say that this process can't be regulated. Uh, there are factors that are known to, to boost differentiation and, and slow differentiation, but on their own, these cells are able to differentiate. Uh, and then this is, this was a really fascinating study. Um, and so, uh, you, as you know, a simple study, they took again, oligodendrocyte progenitor cells and they placed them onto axons. And you can see in these cell culture models, you can see myelination. And then they took a very strange approach. They took these oligodendrocyte progenitor cells and they placed them onto dead axons. And the reason they did this is because they wanted to know whether there was axonal cues that stimulate myelination. And so if you were to see uh, no myelination, I would suggest that you need some active components of the axon to stimulate myelination. Um, and so one might you know, have guessed, and I probably would have guessed at the time, that uh, if you plate OBCs onto dead axons, you probably get nothing. Uh, but surprisingly, they found the exact opposite. So this is an example of these OPCs that were played onto live axons. And if you stain with MBP, which is a myelin protein, you can see these stripes, which is the myelin sheaves of these cultured oligodendrocytes. If you take a look at these same cells on dead axons, you still see a very striking um, amount of myelination by these progenitor cells. And I think this is really important because this suggests that the oligodendrocytes are able to myelinate in the absence of axonal cues again, suggesting that oligodendrocytes have the capacity independent of their environment to um, not just uh, differentiate, but to myelinate axons. Uh, and in, indeed, there's been work to follow up on this, suggesting that oligodendrocytes can myelinate anything roughly the size of an axon. Uh, you know, an axon sort of bigger than one micron in diameter, these cells can actually myelinate them. So they can myelinate fibers and, and other such structures. Uh, and finally, uh, and I think this is a bit, a bit timely because some new studies, the question is, is it the oligodendrocyte that's myelinating or is it the oligodendrocyte progenitor cell that is myelinating? Uh, and there's been a number of studies here and it's actually quite contentious. Uh, this is one study where they took a look at zebrafish. And the thing that's nice in zebrafish is that you can watch uh, these cells in living specimens and you can watch them myelinate over time. And if you do this, what you see is if you track, you know, with this marker that labels oligodendrocyte lineage cells, you can see that these oligodendrocytes, they reach out to axons, which is really neat. And then in this light shade of blue here, they again, they start to produce uh, myelin sheaths, which uh, are these structures here. And uh, what's really interesting over time is you can appreciate that these structures get longer, uh, but there isn't more production from about you know, 210 minutes. So this is a quantification of these, uh, these myelin sheaths. And I think this shows you that there's initially within the first 240 minutes, uh, a massive production of new myelin sheaths, but this stabilizes. And if you follow these cells, even days and days later, they don't have more myelin sheaths, suggesting that there's a critical window for these cells to put down new, uh, new myelin sheaths. And there is some retraction, so there's some loss of these sheaths, but there isn't a production of new myelin sheaths. Um, you know, there, I don't want to get into the, to all the literature here, but there is some evidence that under some conditions, oligodendrocytes uh, in animal models can produce um, new myelin sheaths, uh, but this seems to be uh, the rarity, not the exception. So um, it's the oligodendrocyte progenitor dependent differentiation and myelination program that seems to be most useful for remyelination as it relates to at least our animal models and uh, also I think with multiple sclerosis. So uh, a bit of a metaphor uh, of the oligodendrocyte. I like this one. Uh, this is a picture of my father, Dave Flemmel. Um, he's building a deck, which is what he uh, has done a lot of over his life. Um, my dad is sort of a, a handyman, very capable, um, very effective <laughs> with his time. And so uh, I think of the oligodendrocyte as, as having all the tools naturally to, 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 to do what it needs to do. And so if you think of this metaphor, like, well, what would prevent this deck from being formed? You know, when we start to imagine why remyelination fails. And so certainly uh, as long as you have the tools uh, and, and so oligodendrocytes do need certain nutrients, of course, to do what they need to do. Uh, and, 
if you have the, the location, then this, you know, in this metaphor, the deck gets built. However, if there's something in the environment that prevents uh, the deck from being built, then it's, it, of course, it's not gonna be built. Uh, and so, you know, um, my thought of the illegal dinner site is that they're very self-sufficient uh, and left to their own device, given an environment where they're, you know, they have adequate trophic, uh, trophic factors around, they're able to, uh, to produce myelin. So uh, after that discussion of illegal dinner site biology, let's talk about why we think remyelination fails. Um, and so just a reminder that, you know, we have these different stages of uh, ligonar site biology. We have this, what we call OPC recruitment, which is the progenitor cells dividing and going into the lesion uh, at sufficient density. Uh, and then we have the stage which is referred to as OPC differentiation, where these progenitor cells differentiate into oligodendrocytes. And then it's also possible that even these late stages of remyelination are impaired, where you have um, defects in the capacity to remyelinate for uh, a number of reasons. So normally when we talk about remyelination failure, we kind of break it into these phases. So first I want to talk about recruitment failure and is it important? Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that OPCs occupy a spatial domain. And what I mean is this is a beautiful example by Ethan Hughes of an oligonocyte progenitor cell. He, he looked at these cells in, in live imaging and you can see that there's a lot of, um, there's actually movement of these cells over time. Uh, and there's these fine processes that are kind of navigating their environment. Uh, what's really interesting is that if you take a look at this green process and this purple or red process from an adjacent cell, what you see is the cell goes and makes contact and then it ultimately retracts, suggesting that OPCs are in a way um, using self-repulsion of processes to define a spatial domain that they occupy. Uh, and this is important because that, you know, presumably this is how they reach their density. And, and why do I think this is important? Um, there was one really nice study, again, uh, by Jonah Chan's group, where they took OPCs and they played them onto DRG cultures. And they found that, you know, probably not surprisingly, but if you put, um, you put OPCs of a higher, uh, of a lower density, it takes them longer to myelinate. And if you plate them at a higher density, they myelinate more quickly. And so uh, they used a number of strategies to, to argue in this study that, that OPCs need to reach a critical density before the remyelination begins. And so this density is quite important, um, likely to initiate uh, the program of differentiation and myelination. So if we take a look at MS lesions, um, there's this one study and there was another study um, by Walswick showing that there is progenitor cells in all different stages of MS lesion. So even the most chronic MS lesions have progenitor cells. And so if you're a glass half full person, you might say that, well, this suggests that there is a population of progenitor cells in the MS lesion that is quiescent for some reason, unable to myelinate. Um, and so, you know, that suggests that maybe differentiation is impaired. Uh, but I guess a glass has empty person might say, well, these progenitor cells and many of these lesions haven't necessarily reached a critical density. And so maybe it's actually recruitment failure that is stalling them in their capacity to, uh, to reach the density required for, for remyelination. So, um, you know, this, this finding of lower density, not a, as many people look at it, but uh, there is some, again, variability, lesion to lesion in OPC density, but at least with the lesions they looked at here, they tend to be a little lower density of OPCs. Another thing that has been described, and there's a large body of literature here that I don't want to get into all the details, but there's many known inhibitors of remyelination, uh, and many of these inhibitors are affecting either the differentiation or migration, or sometimes both. Um, some of these are found on the um, on a bunch of membranes, whether it be axonal or OPCs themselves. Uh, many of these factors are found in the extracellular environment that have been validated and shown to be upregulated in chronic MS lesions. Uh, and, and then others are, you know, ECM based or other uh, inhibitors. Uh, myelin debris, uh, which we'll talk a little bit in a bit, is a, a known inhibitor of this, of this process from, you know, the OPC to the oligodendrocyte. So there's many inhibitors. 
and I think where this is really important, and this is a wonderful study by Michael Keough uh, in Wee Young's lab, who did this work when I was there. Uh, what, so first off, uh, the lab had done a lot of work to show that CSPGs, which is a, a proteoglycan, are inhibitory for uh, the development of oligodendrocytes in culture. So if you take an oligodendrocyte progenitor cell and you plate it down, they have this nice morphological growth. Um, and so uh, you see this, this nice growth. And if you plate them onto this inhibitory environment, which are the CSPGs, there's much less growth. And I think you can appreciate, one, there's fewer cells, but also those cells that do stick down, there's less growth. So then what uh, Michael did was he wanted to, study whether the known, there's a, a number of known medications that can promote the differentiation of oligodendrocytes, uh, whether they work in an environment that's inhibitory. And so uh, Michael looked at a number of medications and he found surprisingly, in, and all of these have been validated to be beneficial um, in a normal or like non-inhibitory environment. But when he placed these medications in an inhibitory environment, there was actually a really modest, if, if anything, benefit to all of these medications, suggesting that um, it's possible that those inhibitory factors present in the MS lesion might trump the benefits of the medications uh, that are promoting oligodendrocyte differentiation. And so uh, it's important to consider the extracellular environment in the context of remyelination. Uh, one other thing that is, is uh, long known to be important in remyelination is age. Uh, I think this is really interesting because uh, if you take a look at multiple sclerosis, um, there is an age in which people start to progress and this is irrespective of whether they have relapsing remitting or, or secondary or relapsing remitting or progressive MS. So there seems to be an age dependent decline associated with progression. And there's also an age associated decline in remyelination. So this is a wonderful study, but there's been many more uh, looking at an animal model and in this animal model, um, what is done is you cause a focal demyelination and then you just track remyelination by looking at axons uh, and whether they do or do not have myelin. And so if you do this in a young mouse, by four weeks, the vast majority of these axons are remyelinated. Um, however, if you look at an older, in this case, rat, and you inject uh, and cause demyelination, at four weeks, there's actually not really efficient remyelination. Only half the axons are remyelinated. But then if you sort of double that amount of time and look uh, about a month later, then all of a sudden there is actually quite robust um, re remyelination in these later time points, suggesting that aging slows this remyelination process. And this is important because as I mentioned, uh, axons uh, do die if remyelination is impaired. So there's probably also a little bit of axonal loss associated with this slower remyelination. Okay, so uh, we talked a lot about uh, remyelination failure. Uh, what can we do to promote remyelination? Uh, and there's, a, there's some really wonderful studies um, uh, that have been done here. So this is a review that I did up with Wei and, and we, um, when I was in uh, Wei's lab on the biology of remyelination and characterizing some of the therapies. I think this is a really exciting time. So uh, right off the bat, there is no approved medications that promote remyelination. Uh, so this is a, a, an open, exciting area for therapeutics uh, for people with MS. Um, there is a number of exciting targets, though, and some of these are at various stages of the pipeline. So, for instance, uh, we, who, uh, who I don't think is here, but he'd be remiss if I didn't talk about domperidone. Um, uh, we uh, showed uh, with others in the, in the group that prolactin promotes remyelination, and domperidone is a medication, and I'm not really sure how how it does this, but it boosts the levels of prolactin. And so the thought is that domperidone might promote remyelination through the, the increase in prolactin. Uh, there's also a number of medications that act through this M1 muscarinic or H1 or H3 histamine uh, receptors. Um, the, there's an active um, beta-catenin pathway that inhibits remyelination. And so there's a couple targets looking at this pathway. And uh, there's also a number of targets that are looking at these um, um, uh, uh, receptors uh, in, the, in the nucleus. These, so this is a vitamin D receptor, a thyroid receptor, uh, retinoid X receptor. So in a lot of these um, nuclear 
um, receptors have been shown to be beneficial for myelination. And there's a number of strategies now to try and boost uh, remyelination using these. Uh, of, of these, so I think you can appreciate in, you know, most of these targets are centering around the oligodendrocytes, and most of them are targeted at promoting differentiation. Uh, there's one target, which is lingo. This is an anti-lingo approach. Lingo is an inhibitor, and there is one medication, which is a monoclonal antibody that antagonizes lingo to try and boost remyelination that is, is looking, being looked at in the clinical trials. So I just want to talk about one of these therapies just to give you a sense of how these studies are done, how do we learn about these medications. So this is an example of uh, a study that tried to look through a number of medications to try and find new remyelination therapies. And it's a really elegant study by Jonah Chan's lab. So what they did is they had these micro pillars. Uh, you can actually see the micro pillars and they plated oligodendrocytes onto these micro pillars. Uh, and so, as I mentioned before, oligodendrocyte progenitor cells are able to wrap uh, and, and differentiate and wrap um, any structure that has similarities to an axon. And so in this case, these OPCs um, are making contact with differentiating and wrapping these pillars. And so if you were to look from the top down, you would see these, you'd either have OPC rings, which are OPCs that have ensheathed but have not started to produce myelin, or you have these uh, oligodendrocyte rings, which are the processes of new, new myelin. And the thought would be with this micropillar assay, you're looking at these rings and you're trying to increase the number of rings that are oligodendrocytes, so increase myelin rings. And so they did this, and this is actually what the data looks like. So if you have a control sample, you have a lot of the green rings, which are the OPC rings. Then if you add a known factor that promotes differentiation, thyroid hormone three, uh, this causes more red rings, and you can actually see more red than green. One medication that they found that was really beneficial is clomestin. So clomestin, when added into these cultures, caused many more of the red rings and fewer of the green rings. And let's see clomestin here. So you see, compared to control, there's much more uh, myelin rings. And so clomestin uh, was then pursued further to see whether it could promote remyelination. And so in this particular example, similar to other uh, studies on remyelination, they injected a toxin that causes focal demyelination in a, in a mouse. And then in these uh, studies, they gave clomestin as a medication. And then they took a look at the lesions and measured the amount of axons that have myelin or don't have myelin. So here's an example of an axon that doesn't have myelin. Uh, and then here you have an example of an axon that does have myelin. It's, it's a little thicker, a little darker. You can see a little more strikingly. So if you look over at the clomestin group and just visualize it, you see there are many more axons with this darker um, myelin sheath. And, and they quantified this and they found that in the control, 29% of the axons were unmyelinated. And then with oral clomestin, there was 9% of the axons were unmyelinated, suggesting that clomestin is able to boost uh, the remyelination, remyelination capacity of these mice. So there is now, two studies that are undergoing to look at clomestin in clinical studies. This first rebuild is a phase two um, crossover trial. And this is actually completed and published, um, I think a couple years ago in the Lancet. And they found actually that um, when you take a look at people who have chronic optic neuritis, which means that they have had damage to their optic nerve and it's persisted for a long period of time, uh, they give these people clomestin and they did see improvements in the latency suggesting of more remyelination. So clomestin seems to work, uh, at least in this, this population. And now they're looking at uh, clomestin in a more um, uh, acute optic neuritis. I think they're looking at it relapsing remitting MS and, and other studies. Uh, just to, to highlight it, some of the challenges I didn't want to get into here, but it's actually quite hard to measure remyelination in people when you're using MRI uh, and PET. Uh, and so uh, there's still a lot of discussion on the best way to study these medications where you have lesions uh, in many places throughout the brain. And so, you know, this is uh, one of the ongoing challenges of uh, remyelination studies uh, in the clinical setting. And there's uh, wonderful work actually being done by in Calgary by some uh, trying to improve upon um, the myelin-centric imaging uh, with MRI that's, I think, really exciting. Uh, okay, and finally, I just wanna talk about 
uh, microglia, macrophage, and their role in remyelination, because I think this is an exciting area that uh, we're working on. Um, so microglia are, let's see if I can start this. I think I might have to turn this off. So uh, this is a study by Nimberjan, a wonderful study uh, showing that microglia are highly dynamic. So microglia, they're the innate immune cell of the brain and they're constantly navigating their environment. So this is something we know about them for a long time. Uh, and if you take a look at the microglia after an injury, this is really fascinating. So this is where there was an injury, their processes come out to this injury site. Uh, they are um, rapidly uh, responding to this injury uh, and it's known, which is relevant, they're gonna be clearing the cellular debris. Uh, they're gonna be uh, surrounding this lesion site and preventing uh, any damage from um, growing. Uh, and, and they're generally thought to be advantageous in this regenerative process. So microglia are present and, and likely important. Um, oh, sorry. I skipped. So, um, so why is this of importance to remyelination? So this is, a, again, some work I did in my PhD, actually, where I took oligonercite progenitor cells and I plated them onto um, a, a cover slip. And on that cover slip, we had myelin debris uh, that was kind of scattered. So there was like little dots of myelin. And so then I could assess what the cells look like on the myelin and off the myelin and measure things that are indicative of oligodendrocytes. So I measured a number of different cellular markers. These are all markers of uh, different stages of oligodendrocytes. And I think what you can appreciate is that um, there is much fewer cells expressing these markers when they were on the myelin, uh, suggesting that myelin is, is quite inhibitory, much like CSVGs, for the development of these progenitor cells um, in culture. And it's also thought to be, uh, and there's some wonderful work by Robin Franklin's group showing that if you, if you take myelin debris and you inject it at the time of remyelination, it slows remyelination. So myelin is thought to be an important inhibitor of remyelination. And so uh, this is important because microglia and macrophages are the cells that are getting rid of this myelin debris. So uh, this is just a schematic of what I think is happening following remyelination. Uh, or during the process of remyelination and how I think microglia and macrophage are involved. So uh, after a cellular injury, you have a, a cell death of different flavors. Um, this cell death can be important because it can initiate a cascade of inflammation. Uh, depending on uh, the severity of this injury and the cytokines and chemokines released, you get both the activation of microglia, so these microglia retract their processes and form this more phagocytic uh, amoeboid-like structure cell, but also you have the recruitment of blood monocytes. So monocytes can enter through the blood, come into the parenchyma where the lesion site is, uh, and again, have this more phagocytic amoeboid-like macrophage. Um, by historical uh, tools, the problem was that we really didn't we couldn't differentiate between these different populations. And so um, you'll see often in the literature, at least now, uh, we refer to them as microglia and macrophage because most studies don't differentiate between these important populations. And because of this, we don't really appreciate what these cells are doing and then whether they have different roles or similar roles. Uh, and so this is a, a very active area of interest in my own research group. And then it's thought that um, these uh, cells are very important for creating an environment for regeneration where remyelination can occur. And just to point out why I think the environment is so important, uh, if you recall, I talked about my Keo study where they plated um, these uh, oligodendrocytes, progenitor cells onto inhibitory environment. And in the presence of an inhibitor, the cells were less able to differentiate, but they're also less responsive to, to drugs that promote their differentiation. And so I think it's really important to, to imagine creating a, and fostering a more regenerative environment in parallel with drugs that promote differentiation. So uh, how do we study the role of microglia and macrophage during remyelination? Um, so this is an animal model we commonly use in the lab where we inject uh, LPC or lysophosphatidylcholine. Uh, some people also refer to this as lysolecithin. We inject this into the white matter of the mice uh, on the ventral side. And this causes uh, really robust, quick demyelination. 
Um, we did studies when I was with uh, we and Peter in Calgary to take a look at the LPC, and we find that uh, it's cleared very quickly, within hours. And so the LPC comes in, it causes almost immediate toxicity, and then it's cleared away very quickly. So this gives a nice window uh, where you have a very acute injury, and then you can see how this injury resolves over time. Uh, another benefit of this model is that it happens in a very specific location, uh, and so you can track uh, this location uh, over time. So uh, I don't want to, didn't want to get into the genetics here, but we use a model, a mouse model, to track microglia. It's a new model. It was published uh, recently um, by myself and a, a lot of wonderful people uh, looking at uh, sort of the role of microglia in these monocyte red macrophage. So uh, the, the summary of, of some of this work is that the microglia with this tool are labeled with TD tomato or a red fluorescent protein, uh, and the blood drive white blood cells are not labeled with TD tomato. So then we can use this tool to differentiate the role of microglia from those monocytes, uh, which is something we couldn't previously do. And so uh, what we've done here is we've taken a look at uh, microglia because they're TD tomato and macrophage that are not TD tomato. And we just asked a simple question, how much myelin debris is consumed by these different populations of cells? And so in this case, CD45 is going to label both populations. Uh, the NBP here is, uh, is, is going to be labeling the myelin debris. NBP is a major protein found in myelin. Uh, and then we can then capture how much of this myelin debris is in the TD tomato positive and the TD tomato negative cells. And so this is uh, an early study, and we're still uh, working to increase numbers uh, and do some of this again. But what we found overall was that uh, when we look at microglia and macrophage, there is an equivalent volume of myelin debris, suggesting that both microglia and macrophage collaborate in the removal of myelin debris. Um, there's, surprisingly, there's actually more microglia around, uh, but the macrophage are a little bit bigger, and so that seems to account for why there's a similar volume of uh, debris that is consumed by these two cells. Um, this is another study, and I apologize, this is a bit busy, uh, but I'll walk you through it because I think it's really interesting. So uh, another thing that uh, we did uh, when I was with WE and now we're, we're pursuing this a lot more is we did single cell RNA sequencing of microglia inside of the lesion. And so for this experiment, what we've done is we've injected this, this demyelinating agent and this has caused overt demyelination. And then uh, five days after the injury, which corresponds to a period uh, prior to uh, the differentiation, prior to the remyelination, we've taken out the microglia because we just wanted to ask the question of what are microglia looking like inside of, of these LPC lesions. Uh, and in this particular example, um, we have what's called a UMAP, which is a, a way of reducing all this information into a 2D plot. Uh, in this particular map, the relationship of each of these dots, which are cells, gives uh, the spatial relationship gives how similar they are. And so what you can appreciate is by and large, the lesion associated microglia are quite different from the naive microglia, suggesting that the program for which these microglia change are, are pretty profound. Um, and then another thing we can do is we can cluster these lesion associated microglia. So in this particular case, uh, we have four different clusters of microglia that are uh, found in the lesion. And so we think these clusters are different populations or phenotypes of microglia. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of a, uh, an example, IRF7, which is uh, interferon responsive uh, gene, uh, is highly enriched in this little cluster here, which is cluster six. Um, and so it's, it's almost um, specific. So this gives you uh, a cluster of microglia that are, are expressing this RF7. And another cluster that we were interested in is this IGF-1 uh, cluster. So remember IGF-1 is a, a factor that is promoting the survival of uh, oligodendrocytes in culture. It's also highly enriched in a population of microglia uh, following uh, LPC-induced demyelination, which is really interesting. Um, and so we have, it's interesting though, we have several clusters. So we have several populations or phenotypes of microglia that are present in, in this one time point post LPC. Uh, and of course, now we're really interested in pursuing like how these, how these populations change over time. 
So uh, this is just a reminder uh, of these original Barris studies where you take uh, progenitor cells and you give it factors to promote survival. And insulin and IGF-1, IGF-2 are really dramatically promoting the survival of the intersite progenitors and culture. So if we take a look at an LPC lesion, and this is a seven-day lesion, so this is an intermediate time point, uh, we used RNA scope to label the various, uh, various populations. So this FCRLS, this is a, a marker that we can use to label microglia. So you can see that microglia are highly enriched in this demyelinated lesion, which is right here. Uh, what's also really fascinating is that there's this population of IRF7 positive microglia that's actually spatially segregated from the other. So, you know, this is, these are highly enriched in IRF7. Uh, and then if we look at IGF-1, they're found sort of more ubiquitously throughout the lesion. So this is really fascinating. We have segregations of different populations of microglia found within the, the demyelinated lesion. And of course, we don't really appreciate how this is happening or why this is happening, uh, but we're doing a lot of work to try and figure this out. And this is a wonderful stain by uh, Madeline Hull. So uh, Madeline did a quantification of this over time uh, where she quantified the amount of IGF-1 um, inside of, of, in this case, TD tomato or microglial cells, and IRF7 inside of um, uh, TD tomato microglial cells. And what you can see is that there is a population of microglia in the demyelinated lesion early on that are expressing both IGF1 and IRF7, but there's also a population that is expressing either IGF1 and not the other, or IRF7 and not the other. So at, at day at day five, this early intermediate time point, most microglia express one or two of these markers, and they, they can be different populations. And this looks very similar to what I showed you with that um, UMAP study earlier, the single cell RNA sequencing. But there is some, and I think this is important to point out too, that are not labeled with these markers, suggesting there might be yet still uh, other populations of microglia. Uh, and when we look over time, what we see is that uh, these populations change, uh, and interestingly enough, there's a, a larger proportion of cells that are labeled with neither of these markers. And, and this is really interesting because this is a period of active uh, differentiation and the start of remyelination. And so I think that there's probably, and we're, we're trying to figure this out, a population of remyelination associated microglia that are labeled with other markers. And we're trying to understand this biology right now. I think it's really fascinating. Uh, if we take a look at IGF, one in particular, um, what we can do is we can get rid of microglial cells through another genetic uh, tool that we have in the lab. Uh, and so if we get rid of the, the microglia, there's, you can see this red staining here, hopefully, is the IGF-1. Not all of the IGF-1 is in microglia, but uh, enough of it is. Uh, and if you look at the lesion in both of these examples, there is uh, less uh, IGF-1 immunoreactivity when we get rid of the microglia. And so this is just shown here in quantification. So there is uh, microglia expressing IGF-1. When we get rid of microglia, then there's less IGF-1. And this, again, is important because this is a, an important trophic factor for the survival of progenitor cells and, and oligodendrocytes. Uh, and similarly, and this is, you know, very early days, we're doing a lot of work to try and uh, increase numbers and, and double, uh, double check this. But what we see is when we get rid of microglia, there is fewer oligodendrocytes present at seven days. Uh, and so we're still making uh, progress here, but our early data support the idea that microglia are important for remyelination, um, potentially through the secretion of this IGF-1. Uh, we think they might be supporting the survival of oligodendrocytes, but we're still doing a lot of work to try and and, and see if that is indeed the case. Um, so uh, just to, as a take home of my interest with regards to remyelination, uh, we know that microglia in, in different conditions uh, can be beneficial and in some conditions we think they might even be cytotoxic. Uh, and we like to think that maybe the phenotype of these microglia dictates those particular functions. Uh, and so we're really interested in remyelination because it gives us a window into the lens of these regenerative capacity of microglia. Uh, and what we're seeing is that there's many different flavors of microglia during this uh, seemingly simple process. And we still don't know why there's different phenotypes and whether these phenotypes are functionally distinct, 
which I think is really fascinating. Um, we don't know how these phenotypes relate to MS, which is another area of interest for the lab. Um, and and uh, trying to understand the overall biology of what these cells are doing to promote remyelination is, of course, very important. Um, but also on the other lens, we're also really interested in how microglia might go astray to speak and become injury inducing and by what mechanisms that might occur. So these are sort of various aspects of, of the lab and what we're interested in. So as a summary, um, so the take homes, we know that remyelination is variable for people with MS. Uh, it's still unclear why remyelination fails, but I, I think there's sufficient data to su suggest that it relates in part to different inhibitors in the MS lesion. Uh, as I think that remyelination is more about disinhibition. Uh, microglia and macrophage collaborate to eat myelin debris, which we know is inhibitory, uh, and microglia are heterogeneous um, after demyelination. And one population of these are IGF-1 expressing, and, and the lab is interested in this population uh, in, in particular. So one, uh, as a new lab, I'd like to give tribute to the wonderful people who are in my group right now. Uh, this is a bit of an older picture, but uh, you know, sorry for those that are missing, uh, but I have the pleasure of mentoring a number of wonderful people. Madeline Ho, she did uh, that RNA scope and that quantification. Chorbo Baclini, he's doing some really exciting work on the role of microglia during remyelination using this microglia ablation. Uh, Kelly is the technician lab. She helps with so many things. Uh, Martin was a German um, a graduate student in the lab for a while working on the cytotoxic role of microglia. Samira, she's doing some really excellent work on single cell RNA sequencing so we can understand the biology of microglia and their phenotypes during remyelination. And Brady Hammond is, is undergoing a study where he's looking at the development of microglia to try and understand how they reach um, a level uh, of uh, 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 how they proliferate and, and reach their homeostasis. Uh, I also like to thank a number of collaborators. Peter is still a very wonderful collaborator. We, uh, who I'm not sure is here, but it has been very extremely helpful in this transition to a uh, uh, faculty. Um, Jeff Bernaski has helped with, uh, and Joe Stratton have helped with this single cell RNA sequencing. I also have uh, you know, active collaboration with my former mentor, Wolfram Tetzloff, and some really exciting work with Gert Schenk and I on um, uh, MS lesions that we're really excited about. Uh, my lab is also joined up with the Kerr lab in the same space. And so Brad and his people have been extremely important in, in helping uh, these research activities as well. Of course, we have a number of funders that I'm very grateful for uh, and uh, a lot of exciting faculty as part of the U of A MS Center and the uh, Faculty of Medicine. So uh, thank you for your attention. I see that I haven't left a lot of time for questions, but I'm going to take those now. So, um, Nitu, do you want me to just go through these? Um, yeah, do you see the panel uh, no. below? There's a yes. chat section. Yeah, you can find yeah. the questions there. Okay, so first question. Uh, can remyelination therapies help repair axonal damage or just prevent future damage? Late terms, it seems we are repairing the wire insulation, but the wire may still be damaged. That's a really fair point. Um, you know, in truth, we don't know. <coughs> we, we, we are sure that it can prevent future damage, uh, but is there a capacity for myelin to actually repair a damaged axon? Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm not sure of anybody who's looking at this either. This is a very outstanding question that I think should be looked into, um, but I, I don't think there's anything in literature that speaks to this. Um, if the ligand endocytes seem to intrinsically myelinate without external guidance, how do they know where to form nodes or rambier? Uh, would nodes still form when myelinating something which is not an axon? So uh, nodes or rambier, good question. Um, so there is some evidence that the nodes are, um, uh, can be initiated by the axon. So this uh, these nodal structures uh, is a, you know, it's a bit of a collaboration between the ligand site and the axon. And so uh, the studies that look at these, um, these cultures, I don't know of any that actually look at the node of Ranvier. So I'm actually a little unsure what the nodes look like in the absence of these external guidance cues. 
uh, at the end of, uh, you know, as you imagine, the myelin kind of spreads out and then ultimately stops, and that's where the nodes uh, occur. Um, and so that would probably happen in the absence of fuse. But I, I think axons actually are found now to have certain molecules that can dictate where these nodes will be. So uh, again, it's probably a lot more of a collaborative effort. Um, regarding remyelination, are there ways, if it is possible, to prevent different inhibitors from inhibiting remyelination? Yeah, disinhibition, I think, is really exciting. Uh, the, the challenge here, so there is, for instance, uh, the anti-lingo therapy uh, is targeting lingo specifically. Uh, Wee's group has done a number of studies looking at different ways of antagonizing CSPG production, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, the one concern is that we still don't know if there's like some inhibitors that are more uh, robust or more important than other inhibitors. And so um, which inhibitor to inhibit is, is the question. And so I think a lot of more work needs to be done here to try and differentiate these inhibitors and try and understand which are, uh, which are the most important. But yeah, you know, on a one-by-one -one basis, people are doing this work, yes. Um, uh, Manoj, when you mentioned about single sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, can you tell how many populations of microglia were detected in the healthy CNS and if they function differently? So uh, I tend to gloss over the healthy populations because there does seem to be several clusters of those too. Um, and, and where, uh, so I haven't done any further exploration of these different populations of healthy CNS uh, microglia. And so I can't really speak to that, Manoj. Uh, there is some people, of course, that look at heterogeneity of microglia in different brain regions, but again, we're taking from one brain region, so it is a bit surprising that we see different populations. I haven't explored that very well. One possibility that we hadn't thought about then, but I've started thinking about now, is that there, we, when, whenever we do these studies, we mix sex, and so maybe some of these populations might actually relate to male versus female populations of microglia possible. I don't know. I, I haven't really explored it more. Um, so to what extent are oligonocytes that survive injury um, targets for remyelination therapy? So we're talking about oligonocytes. Um, is OPC differentiation driven remyelination more or less prone to mistargeting its new myelin processes compared to the, those produced by existing oligonocytes? So this is a very contentious area that I, I kind of wanted to sidestep the idea of OPC derived remyelination versus oligodendrocyte derived remyelination. Right now there's uh, three studies, three or four studies, uh, two studies suggesting that it can happen in MS uh, or at least in, in larger animals. Um, so one looked at, I think it was primates um, and another looked at MS tissue, shadow plaques. They argue that it can happen, although those studies are both a little problematic for different reasons. Um, I think better there's two newer studies, one in zebrafish uh, and one by Ethan Hughes group looking at um, gray matter remyelination. Uh, both groups find that the OPC dependent remyelination seems to be more profound, more important. In uh, the zebrafish one where they can model and really look at this in real time, which is important uh, for this process, uh, they found that the oligodendrocyte derived remyelination had like either they had these really short stubby um, internodes and they, the, uh, they didn't cover nearly as much axons. So I think uh, this is important to keep in mind. It seems to be less efficient. Okay, uh, Jason, you mentioned that dead axons can be myelinated and it's been demonstrated that inert object can be myelinated. Do damaged axons hinder remyelination? This is a really interesting question. So uh, it's suspected that this is the case. Uh, so because uh, axons aren't doing anything active to promote remyelination, or there seems to be a limited role in that capacity. What could be happening is that axons could, when becoming injured, express inhibitors of remyelination. This is a possibility that nobody's studied. I think it's really exciting, uh, but nobody's done it yet. Uh, I think it's probably happening. Uh, you do tend to see, um, you know, axons that are injured not being remyelination. So, uh, but Again, the biology of that is completely yet to be discovered. I think it's, I think it's